Are you at the uh, office? Yeah, I am uh, in the cabinet office. Uh, this is the executive UN. Yeah. Okay, cool. So um, I'd like to talk to you about uh, the success uh, of Taiwan in handling the pandemic. And I have to ask you first, the mm -hmm. festival photos I've seen from Taiwan. Mm -hmm. I've seen like a crowd of people. People didn't even wear masks. Mm -hmm. Are these photos real? Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are real. These are not uh, 2019 uh, documentary uh, footages. Uh, these are real people. And if you see them outdoors, they're not required to wear a mask as long as they keep roughly one meter or two Shiba Inu uh, distance uh, from each other. But we do have our mask ready. Uh, so when it gets too dense or if it's on public transportation, then we do put them on. I like to describe you my normal day right now. I, uh, I work from, if possible, I work from home. Um, many countries in Europe are experiencing a second lockdown. You are obliged to wear masks. In Switzerland, the restaurants, etc., are closed right now. Team sport isn't possible. Lots of people are worrying they cannot spend Christmas with their loved ones. Mm -hmm. How does daily life look like in Taiwan right now? Um, so we don't have a local transmission case in the past. I, I lose the count, 230 days or something. Uh, and so we were post-COVID for, for a very long time. So in addition uh, to the mask availability and keeping some social distance, um, I think the main change is those uh, thermometers. Uh, like when I uh, get into the cabinet building and into the legislature, uh, there's still a thermometer uh, measuring my temperature. But, but otherwise, life is normal. I mean, we just a few weeks ago have a pride parade uh, with actually the inaugural transgender parade um, in, in, in Taiwan. The interesting part is, of course, the pride part. Uh, the uh, LGBTQ part, uh, and and it's a it's a really large one, really successful. And mask has become a fashion item. I'm using a, a normal one, but um, I do have uh, with me like rainbow, pink, other colors as well. Yeah, that's awesome. So lots of people say Taiwan's an island, of course, and uh, got lots of pandemic experience, if you'd mm -hmm. like to call it like that way. Uh, with SARS 18 years ago. Is mm -hmm. this your advantage today? Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, we are basically using the playbook uh, that we collectively designed uh, right after SARS 1.0, as I call it, uh, that uh, basically we ask ourselves, we did so badly during SARS 1.0, the municipal government saying completely different thing from the national government, a unannounced indeterminate lockdown of the hoping hospital, uh, people rushing to buy N95 masks so the medical workers don't have them uh, in enough supply. Uh, I can go on, uh, but, but it was not the best of uh, the days. Uh, right. Uh, and so um, after that, the constitutional court uh, said that, you know, this unannounced lockdown indefinite amount is it's barely constitutional it would have been unconstitutional um, if uh, we we know that something like this would happen so they charged the legislature to to write a new design of the act for communicable diseases prevention uh, for the central epidemic command center uh, for all the sort of measures that you're you're seeing now and keeping it running in yearly drills so mm -hmm. everybody above 30 years old remember how traumatic it, it was and when dr li wen liang from wuhan in the whistleblowing social media post said sars has happened again i mean everybody just alarm bells around so so yeah i think this is more of a societal inoculation than anything. Mm -hmm. When have you heard of the new coronavirus um, mm -hmm. first, and when did you start preparing for it? Well, we started preparing for it uh, since 2004. Uh, but to answer your question, <laughs> uh, right, so just to, to, to actually answer your question, uh, I, I don't think uh, many people understood uh, how bad SARS 2.0 would be compared to SARS 1.0. We all eventually discovered it, right? So, uh, but for me personally, I mentioned that SARS uh, has happened again. Something like that has happened again on January the 9th, uh, a, a few days before the presidential election uh, with some uh, delegation journalists, I think, from Denmark. 
uh, that's my, my personal, um, and I learned about it because of the bulletin uh, posted by the Center of um, Communicable Diseases, and they learned about it, I think, around December 31st. Uh, and there's uh, health inspections for all the flights coming from Wuhan to Taiwan on the first day of January. Mm -hmm. Taiwan already sent an email to WHO on December 31st. That's right. Yeah. But we didn't hear anything, so we started those health inspections the very next day. So, what would you say? I mean, you already mentioned like measuring uh, the fever every day and stuff like that. What would you say is the recipe for your success? How did you manage to control the vir virus, especially you as a? Uh, yeah, very, very early on, we understood that if three quarters of people wear the mask uh, for an entire day uh, and wash their hands properly, that alone, three quarters of people doing so will reduce the R value to be under one. Uh, and the main problem of that uh, was how to figure out a message that will, um, sorry about that, go viral uh, on social media and so on uh, to convince people to remind each other to wear a mask and wash their hands. And we eventually settled on a cute spokesdoc that says wear a mask to prevent yourself from your own unwashed hands. And, and that's a very good message. Have you ever had problems with people believing in uh, conspiracy theories and who don't want to wear masks? Yeah, of course, yes. Uh, uh, but uh, as I mentioned, uh, if the message was wear a mask to protect the uh, vulnerable people, wear a mask to show respect to your elderly uh, or whatever, uh, any other message that talks about collectivism or altruism or about um, other things, uh, that will uh, run into this conspiracy theory, um, adversarial uh, messaging. But on the other hand, if you say, wear a mask to protect yourself against your own unwashed hands, you, you can't really counter that argument because it's a, just a self-reminder more than anything. It links mask use to hand sanitation. So, uh, I mean, I, I can't imagine a conspiracy theory says, no, when you wear a mask, you touch your face more. That, that doesn't work, right? So, so, uh, so which is why it's an uh, effective message. I see. Um, Taiwan quickly became a real role model. Um, mm. You even donated masks to the mm. European Union when they were desperately um, in need. Mm. Aren't you angry the World Health Organization doesn't really recognize your success? Mm, well, I think the main thing is about, uh, I feel uh, sad that uh, had that we had ministerial access earlier on, we could have saved people. I mean, uh, Dr. Li Wenliang literally saved the Taiwanese people uh, for, you know, whistleblowing uh, in Wuhan. But his message didn't get to the people in Wuhan. His message was harmonized, quote unquote, harmonized uh, in the uh, beginning of the the epidemic, and because of that, people in Wuhan still held very large gatherings, uh, even when Dr. Li Wenliang already sounded the, the alarm. So he saved Taiwanese people, but not necessarily people in Wuhan. And so had we had ministerial access, we could have saved other people. Do you think, so you think the world would have been better prepared if you be a member of the World Health Organization? Well, you see, the, the World Health uh, Organization works uh, <clears throat> with the contact points that are scientific uh, contact points, and we do have access to, to those. But having scientific access is not the same as having ministerial access, unless uh, your scientific authority, uh, your country's author of epidemiology textbook, happens to be your political authority, like your vice president, um, which is the Taiwan's case, right? <laughs> when our um, uh, epidemiology uh, authority want to convince the vice president, he just looks into the mirror. But but um, unless you have that, such a configuration, uh, we having access to the scientific community, the scientists in other countries, does not mean that these are translated into ministerial actions. Uh, mm -hmm. And so ministerial access is really important, uh, and Taiwan has been excluded from those. You are uh, the digital minister and a uh, digital minister without a portfolio, which I haven't heard before, really. So mm -hmm. how can I imagine your role mm -hmm. in the yeah. pandemic? Yeah, uh, so uh, in the Taiwan uh, cabinet, there's nine ministers without portfolio, or as I prefer to call it, horizontal ministers. Uh, the without portfolio means that there is no ministry reporting to us. Rather, we work across ministries. So in my office, there's 
around a dozen or so ministries that have sent secondments to my office while retaining their original position, like director general, section chief, within their own ministries. Um, they form a kind of horizontal team uh, that works on open government, on social innovation, and on youth engagement. Uh, and social innovation and open government in particular are key in countering the pandemic with no lockdown and the infodemic with no takedown. So um, the idea of uh, the horizontal leadership is that I don't order uh, the ministries to do anything, but I make sure, for example, that the Ministry of um, Economic Affairs, when they're producing such masks, have a really good communication channel with the Ministry of Health and Welfare, which is um, in charge of working with the pharmacy to distribute those masks, uh, or the ministries of science and technology, the National Development Council, and so on, who all uh, have their own open data analytics, computing um, center, and so on, and they can all work together with the civic technologist to ensure the real-time uh, dashboards and participatory accountability, so that when you're queuing in a pharmacy, for example, you can check your phone and see the person queuing before you swipe their national health card and purchased like nine medical masks. Uh, we're increasing that to 10 uh, per two weeks uh, in the rationing scheme. And you're handing out the uh, masks for free or for like a really small fee, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah. Currently, uh, we are charging uh, it, uh, I think, per, per mask, it's uh, 0.15 euros. Um, which is not a large amount, uh, but we're uh, we're we're changing that to um, eleven cents euros, uh, zero point one one euros uh, per medical masks um, around the turn of the year now. Um, so yeah, it, it's uh, very affordable. Uh, even people who are of the lowest uh, income um, strata uh, can easily afford it. Uh, and it's fair. There's no stockpiling possible because uh, you have to present your national health card. Did you have to compromise um, on anything regarding the measures in Taiwan, um, mm -hmm. for example, data privacy? Mm -hmm. No, because we don't collect any new data that we were not already collecting before the pandemic. We, we don't use the pandemic as an excuse to collect new data, period. Which data are you collecting all the time? Um, for example, your cell phone uh, provider, uh, telcos, already have the signal strength uh, of your phone to the cell phone towers. So using that signal strength, uh, which they need to collect be because they need to provide roaming service. Uh, so using that data alone, your telcos can know to a very coarse degree, like 50 meters at most uh, radius uh, where your phone is. And we use that to send SMS automatically for uh, flood evacuation or for earthquake prevention, uh, advance warnings and things like that. And so the same system has been then repurposed uh, to enforce the digital quarantine for people who choose stay at home quarantine instead of hotel quarantine. Um, their phone is then put into uh, the digital quarantine so that if they break out of the quarantine radius or the phone runs out of battery, the telcos will automatically send an SMS not only to them, but to the local medical offices. So isn't this is quarantine not more or less like prison then in Taiwan? No, we call it digital fence. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and this is highly accepted? Uh, well, 91% of people approve of it, and we thank the 9% uh, who convinced the uh, parliamentarians to hold a uh, interpolation, a public hearing uh, session, because you see, we've never declared a state of emergency. So everything we do needs to be pre-approved by the parliament, uh, because our constitutional um, mode is um, continental, uh, the same as the German mode. Uh, so anything that we in the administration do need to be interpreted in a way that is according uh, to the law. Uh, and so the uh, parliamentarians did this public hearing, the Department of Cybersecurity, uh, which works as an information uh, team in the Central Epidemic Command Center, explain exactly how the system works, how the telcos process the data within the telcos, they don't hand it to some other advertisers or some other private sector companies, how after the 14-day quarantine, um, the log is rotated. I mean, the telcos already rotate the log anyway, so you will not get unwanted precision advice, advertisement uh, because of that. And also, um, 
at the end of the day, this is uh, really just about a very narrow but very time limited restriction of movement. And you can choose the hotel quarantine if you don't want the digital fence. Um, and so after uh, they explained this, the approval rate uh, raised to 94%. Of course, we still thank the 6% for keeping us honest, accountable. Did Western leaders, especially from Switzerland, uh, get in touch with you to learn from your example? Um, many uh, medical uh, offices, uh, but I don't know whether they hold public office or not. There's a lot of collaboration epicenter to epicenter wise uh, in the public health uh, sector. In particular, a few days before the World Health Assembly, we held our own kind of pre-assembly assembly. assembly. Uh, and uh, I don't mean the recent one, the, the one uh, that was during the height of the uh, initial pandemic. Uh, and we made sure that we share with the 14 uh, countries uh, and economies, uh, the Taiwan model. Uh, so I, I don't have personally a contact from a high school uh, from Switzerland, but I'm aware that many uh, researchers and academics and journalists are uh, in active conversations uh, with our CECC team. Um, when you see what's happening in Europe from Taiwan, how do you see the European approach uh, compared to your approach? Well, I mean, we, we, we've been there, right? Uh, we, we know how it felt like uh, in the SARS in 2003, and it was devastating. And um, we, we didn't want to go back there, which is why we developed the Taiwan model, right? So, so yeah. Uh, and, and so that is why we're contributing to international efforts by sharing first how we contained the initial outbreak in SARS 2.0, uh, but also, more importantly, to make sure that we provide not only the PPEs, but also the, the know-how of making such PPEs. Uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is very actively uh, working with international counterparts to provide the blueprints that could build those uh, automated plants that can churn out uh, not only medical masks, but also surgical N95 and so on, uh, mask uh, around 2 million a day on a almost entirely automated plant. Um, and the importance of the medical grade is uh, because it's, it's very thin and lightweight, it's far easier to wear it all day as compared to other materials. Do you think Europe is too fixated on data privacy to handle a pandemic? I mean, uh, it, it, it's really important to work uh, to make sure that the data privacy and cybersecurity parameters are not encroached in the name of the pandemic. This we fully support, and which is why we don't collect new data in the name of the pandemic, which is why um, for contact tracing, for example, we rely mostly on traditional interviews and even for the nightlife district like hostess bars and host bars, uh, we make sure that um, even though they have to provide a to contact them or email, those could be throw away or email or um, phone numbers. Uh, and those uh, are kept on the record on the business site, which are shredded after four weeks, and they never have to um, copy that uh, to the government. And so this is a decentralized way to maintain a possibility to contact in the case of outbreak without centralizing information, without over collecting thing. And we do that out of, uh, of course, the privacy first um, idea. And so I, I sympathize with those ideas, uh, but I al always need to um, emphasize it also that uh, we can actually with current uh, generation of technology instead of a false dilemma between data usability on one side and privacy on the other there are a lot of privacy enhancing technologies uh, that can take care of both uh, but the problem is if you have those enrolled uh, like the, our earthquake warnings and things like that um, before the pandemic then people already understand the privacy and cybersecurity parameters. So when we use that in novel, innovative ways during the pandemic, or the National Health Card, that's another really good example that covers 99.99% of citizens and residents. Um, and so these are IC cards, and these, of course, have their privacy and cybersecurity concerns. So we have a law that said it can only be used for public service purposes. So people understood that already. And so because of that during the pandemic, when we use it in novel ways, but don't collect new data. People are okay with that, but having that norm set before the pandemic, very important. So would this be your advice for um, how Europe should prepare for the next pandemic? Exactly, we, we need all to uh, prepare for SARS 3.0 uh, or I don't know, 2.1. Uh, 
preview or whatever, right? <laughs> because the, the virus um, is um, currently hosted by a lot of people and which gives it a, a real possibility for mutation. And, and when it mutates uh, in a kind of flu-like, seasonal flu-like way, um, many of our existing measures will have to be reconsidered and the vaccines may or may not catch up. Uh, and so uh, a conversation when the vaccination for SARS 2.0 is uh, hopefully generally available uh, in the next um, half year or so, I think that's the really good opportunity as kind of a window um, of a conversation, much like our conversation after SARS 1.0 for the society to settle on the privacy and cybersecurity parameters. I've, I've heard um, you have to tighten up some of the measures again. Um, which measures are you tightening up again and is this really necessary? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, there is this uh, winter and autumn uh, idea, right? Uh, that if that's what you're talking about. Um, so uh, what we're saying is that in clinics, uh, public transportation, um, schools, exhibitions, uh, um, religious ceremonies, uh, public sector institutions, uh, the nightclubs stuff. I'm probably missing one. But anyway, in, in one of those uh, places, it is uh, then required uh, to wear a mask. Uh, and if uh, you don't wear a mask, then people will gently nudge you to do so. And those places, uh, some of them, um, most of them, I think, provide masks for you to use if you happen to, to forget one. And if uh, they provide you with a mask and still refuse uh, to, to wear it, then yes, I think you can be uh, fined according to the new measure, uh, I think up to 443 euros. Um, whether that's necessary or not is a CECC uh, question. I, I don't, I'm not an epidemiologist expert, but uh, I think people are generally sympathetic uh, with this measure. From your point of view, when you're looking back at the past 10 months, would you say the pandemic has been better or worse than you expected? SARS 2.0 is definitely worse than SARS 1.0. Uh, the asymptomatic transmission thing uh, caught us um, by surprise. That's, that's, of course, it caught everybody by surprise. Uh, and uh, which actually is why mask and hand washing is even more important in SARS 2.0 than SARS 1.0, because basically anyone, if they touch their own face, uh, even if they have not interacted with anyone with any symptom, is potentially vulnerable. Um, so in that particular regard, SARS 2.0 is definitely worse than we initially expected when we hear about, oh, SARS has happened again in Wuhan uh, in January. Did you finally get an invitation for the next uh, WHO meeting? Uh, I don't think so. Um, I'd like to talk to you about the next steps in the pandemic. Um, so mm -hmm. Europe is quite excited, and I think the US are as well, about the uh, um, vaccines, mm -hmm. which are now coming. Um, have you already, have you developed vaccines yourself, or have you bought uh, some of the Europe ones? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we have developed uh, our vaccines and uh, we're now seeking to um, get uh, 20k uh, volunteers uh, in the potential trials for the domestic uh, vaccines. But we have also entered the COVAX um, arrangement, uh, which you're probably already familiar uh, about. But of course, COVAX, um, it, it has a formula that, that um, basically prioritizes uh, places with higher um, uh, pandemic uh, rates. Uh, and so I understand by that formula, we, we may be uh, the, the, la the last one, uh, or maybe just second to Antarctica. <laughs> I'm sorry? Because you are doing so well. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, maybe next to to Antarctica, uh, to 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 uh, perform so well. And but uh, still, uh, I think we already have budgeted um, a lot of money. I think uh, four hundred million U.S. dollars uh, mm -hmm. for the uh, purchase of one point five million doses. Uh, and so that uh, will protect our frontline medical workers and the most vulnerable groups of people. And in any case, um, everybody else have physical vaccines. We already talked about the people who don't like to wear masks and who are against masks. Do you mm -hmm. also have troubles with the anti-vaccine movement in Taiwan? Mm -hmm. 
I would say that because we build this as physical vaccine and uh, the acceptance rate is now 95%, if I'm not mistaken. So like way past the three quarter um, mark for reducing the R value to one. Uh, and so I, I would say uh, judging by the recent uh, seasonal flu vaccination, uh, people are quite eager to get vaccinated against seasonal flu, much more so than previous year. Uh, and so even though there may be people who are uh, less um, enthusiastic about getting the biological vaccine, there, there are such people. Um, as long as these people are okay with washing their hands and the physical vaccine, I think we'll be doing okay. Great. Um, my last question is quite a personal one, and please let me know if I'm violating any boundaries or something like that. I don't have boundaries. <laughs> if you can see my eyeglass, right? there's no boundaries. <laughs> no others. So, yeah. um, studies have shown, and I've written about that, that company leaders are better in handling the pandemic. Mm -hmm. To which extent does it play a role that uh, Taiwan has a female head of state and that you are defining yourself as non binary? Binary. Well, um, I would say that um, the communication style um, is more more empath empathetic. That that really helps. Our minister Chen Shizhong um, has a way of just relating to any even the most outrageous questions and proposals with a degree of humor and humility. Uh, and so, for example, when a young boy called early. Um, April, mid-April, about when we're rationing our mask, you don't get to pick the color. And it just so happened that he got a rationed uh, mask in pink. Uh, and so he called saying, I don't want to go to school. All my classmates wear blue and I'm the only boy that wear pink. Uh, my classmates will laugh at me. Uh, the very next day, our daily CCC press conference, Minister Chen and all the medical officers, regardless of their gender, wore pink medical mask. Uh, and Minister Chen even said that Pink Panther was his childhood hero. So, so the young boy become not only the most hit boy in the class because he has the hero's mask color, but also the hero's hero's uh, mask color. Uh, and so a lot of brands uh, then just colored their brand pink uh, overnight. So pink for a while become the, the most fashionable color in Taiwan. So, so I would say this is um, a sign of a truly listening at scale, transcultural way of communication and anyone can be a little bit more transgender uh, by putting on pink medical masks. That's a very, very sweet story. Um, so what what do you think, what, is, uh, what are your next, what are your next steps in handling the pandemic? Are there still any obstacles or anything you need to do within the next months? Well, the vaccination, uh, because the vaccine options that we currently have each have their different logistic requirements because of temperature and so on that you're probably already familiar about. So we'll probably have to again use the national IC card uh, to to arrange a um, uh, orderly logistic uh, arrangement uh, when it comes to the um, protecting the vulnerable groups and the people that uh, truly need to be vaccinated first. And that will be a logistic challenge. Um, hopefully less so now that the storage uh, technologies are improving, uh, but we are uh, preparing for those. Thank you very, very much, Audrey. That was the last question from my side. Is there anything we need to talk about? Mm, I think that's that's pretty much it. Uh, and so if I have a final message, still wear a mask to protect against your own unwashed hands from touching your own face. <laughs> Thanks, I will wash hands immediately after the interview. <laughs> Okay, cool. Um, thank you for your great questions. Live long thank and prosper. Thank you very, very much, Audrey. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll upload a video if it's okay to you after you publish. Yeah, great. Okay. Awesome, thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Bye.